be in the book of Jonah this evening. We're going to start in a, a study going through the book of Jonah. <clears throat> Jonah is probably one of the most easily recognizable uh, prophets uh, that we have, uh, of, especially of the minor prophets. Uh, and we all, probably most of us have heard the story or the Sunday school version of Jonah. Uh, Jonah is also the topic of even uh, some movies and things of that like. But it is a very interesting book in that it's the content of it in that uh, it, it is a basically an account of Jonah and his uh, being a, a prophet to Nineveh, basically with the message of it, and it's kind of unique as well that um, we don't really have anything that deals with Israel. Uh, it's all about Jonah and Nineveh. Uh, it, nonetheless, there is still a lot of good information for us, things to learn from, so we're going to be going through it. Uh, just some things about it, we don't really know exactly who wrote the book of Jonah, some assume it's Jonah, but we don't really have anything that is clear cut for us as to the writer. Uh, also, Jonah is another topic of conversation in it, and one of the more well known portions of it is the fact that Jonah does indeed get swallowed up by a large fish, a great fish, and is a, because of that single detail within the book. There are many that want to throw it into a category of uh, a parable or of one that is just basically it was a story to learn from. Uh, oftentimes it's the same kind of category that you get the flood being grouped in. It's not many want to claim it as being something that uh, is just a story that was told in order to teach a lesson. It was not an actual historical account. Going with the idea of it being a parable in of the light, uh, we see in Luke chapter 11 and also elsewhere in the mission, the Gospels of Christ referencing it. And let's go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 11 and read the verse. But in the, the context of it, not really being something that's clear, this verse, of course, speaks to it being received as canon, but also speaks to the reality of it in that in Luke chapter 11 and verse 29, Luke 11 and 29, it says, and when the people were gathered thick together, it began to say, and this is Christ, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was assigned unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Christ here references Jonah and the time that he spent in the great fish. Uh, and it is told as well, and what he is speaking to is this time in the great fish in the three days and three nights that he was in the fish. And this is a reference as well to Christ being in the grave for three days and three nights also. So the fact of Christ mentioning this for us uh, gives it some validity. Also, when we think about it, and you can turn back to Jonah, it does not have the same characteristics as parables in Scripture. All parables have, are always given for a specific interpretation and application. Uh, they, they are given this, and at the end of it, we are given the interpretation or the application of it. It's a very clear thing. But when you look through the book of Jonah, by, by contrast, we see that it's a little bit, it's more complex. It has multiple possible themes and things that it, it teaches us through. It doesn't have one clear message per se. Uh, while you can look at it, you can see things that are the greater messages, specifically in the book of Jonah, one of the biggest things is God's mercy uh, with us and uh, with none of us specifically, but also with Jonah, we see the mercy of God. But there's other things as well that are taught to us from it. 
as I mentioned, the book of Jonah uh, deals with God's command for Jonah to share uh, God's message of repentance uh, to Nineveh. We see as we go through it, we first see that Jonah, upon hearing it, rejects it and seeks to flee from that duty to share it. We see that upon that, the Lord uh, pulls the great, has the great fish swallow him up, and in that time, we see Jonah asking God for repentance. And then it continues, and after being set free, he goes to Nineveh, uh, not excitedly, but he goes nonetheless and preaches to them, uh, preaches a what I would consider a very uh, short and unenthusiastic message, to say the least. Uh, we see that Nineveh actually listens to it, though, in spite of Jonah's heart, and repents. And then we see that Jonah rejects the forgiveness of God and even uh, outright tells God, I didn't want to go because I didn't want them to have the opportunity to repent. Which shows a very poor state within Jonah's heart, but also the greater thing, just being able to see the mercy of God for not just Israel, but also for others as well. So before we get started, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right into this. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to be here this evening, and to be able to study your word, to see uh, just more evidence of your love and compassion for us, Lord. I just pray that you would guide and direct us in your word right now, just help us to listen attentively to it, to understand it, Lord, and not be distracted by other things that may be going on in our lives. Lord, right now we would be focused on you and your word, and that we would listen to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would just guide and direct me as I share your word, please bring remembrance of the things I've studied that our time here ultimately could be for your honor, your glory, and your will. In Jesus' name, amen. We start at verse 1, chapter 1 in Jonah. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, uh, We see here the introduction of Jonah for us. We also have back in 2 Kings, we'll go ahead and turn there. In 2 Kings, we see a mention of uh, Jonah. Gives us just a little bit more information about him. But Jonah doesn't really give us anything except for uh, he and his father. But in 2 Kings chapter 14, 2 Kings chapter 14, fourteen and twenty-three. He says, In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned forty and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, According to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath So we see here, it kind of gives us the timeline of uh, Jonah, and that he was during the reign of Jeroboam to Israel. Uh, also tells us his hometown of gath uh, But nothing else is uh, given to us about him to say. We do see though that he is a, he does do more than just uh, prophesying to Nineveh. He is a, as I said, a prophet to Israel as well. But as we continue back in Jonah in verse 2, it tells us, Arise, or he says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. This is the Lord's message that he gives to Jonah. He tells him, I want you to go to Nineveh and to uh, tell them of their wickedness and tell them of their need to repent. We're not given exactly uh, his message, which is something that in the other 
uh, the other prophets, we see the message itself a lot of times and the information that God has given to them. But as I said, the focus here is on Jonah and uh, his response to all of this. Um, we see it, no, we know of Nineveh as being a great city in the Assyrian Empire. Uh, it was definitely a city that Israel did not like at all. Uh, it was a such it was one of the uh, first empires that they owed taxes to because of mistakes that were made. Uh, and Israel throughout their history had nothing to do, did not want anything to do with Nineveh. Despised them and uh, with their wickedness as well, uh, Israel would have very easily felt themselves to be much greater than Nineveh. We see a bit of this in Jonah and his response to them and uh, seeing them as not worthy of God's blessings. But God states that the reason for sending Jonah is that their wickedness is come up before me. As I said, Nineveh is known uh, for being a very evil city. Uh, it is believed, just, and we see from this in God's uh, wanting to do, uh, basically in the mindset that their destruction is imminent. Uh, we see that this is basically on the same path of Sodom and Gomorrah, which speaks to their evil. Uh, the fact that God is ready to destroy them. One thing I do want us to know is this is not implying that God doesn't take notice of evil until it becomes very great. God takes notice of all evil that takes place. Uh, no matter how small our sins may seem, God does take notice notice to those. And without Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we will answer for those sins. We also have a call to uh, repent of our sins and turn to the Lord and accept His salvation. And if we refuse to do that, no matter how small our sins may seem or no matter how great they will, we will answer for those. In the case of Nineveh, though, what we see is basically their evil has gotten so great it's not that God is just now noticing it. It's that it's gotten so great that God's hand is now forced in the matter. Oh, God is a God that is very long-suffering and very patient. But eventually, His patience and His long-suffering runs out. In the case of Sodom and Gomorrah and surrounding cities, it ran out. In the case of uh, the people that lived during Noah's day, with the exception of Noah and his family, God's patience ended. His long suffering ended. But it's for us to take notice that there does come a time when God says, Enough is enough. To think that you are allowed to get away with it, or to think that to take advantage of God's long suffering is a very dangerous thing to mess with. Because once God says enough is enough, that's it. There will be opportunities for repentance. We see here that in the case of Nineveh, he's wanting to give them one last chance for repentance. We're all given that opportunity, but when the time comes, it's too late. So God has been forced now to give them their final notice. He's chosen Jonah to do this. We see in verse 3 though, it says, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish for, for, from the presence of the Lord. We see that Jonah is not at all excited about this mission that God has given him to go on. He is so upset by it that his decision is to flee not only from this specific command that God has given him, but to flee entirely from his post, his place of, uh, his, his, the place that he is to already be serving. He doesn't just ignore this one, he just gives up everything. It's estimated that this trip that Jonah is wanting to go on would have taken close to a year's time to traverse 
with the other stops in between and things. And so it's, it's interesting here because this would imply here that this was a very expensive trip that he went on or was trying to go on. Jonah is working very hard at this to flee from, as it tells us here, the presence of the Lord and the Lord's will. Later in chapter 4 in verse 2, it tells us, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and a merciful, and merciful slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. We see here that he actually gives his response for why he wanted to flee, why he wanted to reject this. And, and very quickly, he says, because I know that you'll forgive them, God. Jonah was worried that by going to Nineveh and preaching God's word, that these people that he didn't like, that he didn't care for, would be forgiven by God. Oh, it's a very arrogant place to be in. To think, and this is the case with Jonah, he is thinking here that he knows better than God what needs to take place. We'll talk more about it when we get there, but we see that this mindset is what causes Jonah to just flee and run. Makes the attempt to get away from God, definitely to get out of God's land, and hope that he wouldn't have to serve his duty. Something that we're going to see here is that the Lord, you can't run from the Lord. You can't run from what he has planned. But as we continue in verses 4 and 5, he says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. There was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. We see here that Jonah flees. And God comes after him. He sends this wind and it causes the sea to be so rough that these people that were professional sailors had lost all hope of survival. They were, they were throwing things overboard out of their ship, which is to, to keep it lighter, to keep it farther out of the water, to keep it a, a lower chance of it falling apart, capsizing. They had given up all hope for this. Something I want us to notice here as well is that these men, uh, their response, and it says they cried every man unto his God, and of course it is not the real God here that they are praying to. But we notice that in this instance they are seeking their gods for help. But notice what we see with Jonah. He's fast asleep. As we continue in verse 6, he says, So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. The shipmaster himself comes to Jonah and says, We're about to die here, God. We're about to die here. And you're sleeping. Pray to your God. Ask Him to help us. Now, I wonder for Jonah in experiencing this, if it just, the, the irony of it, Jonah is running away from his God. And these men are telling him of his need to seek his God. They are in a panic. They are going to every end. And Jonah is the one that is the cause of it all. It is Jonah's God that can help them the most. And 
Jonah is fighting with his God at this moment. Jonah has rejected his God. Verse 7, it continues, and it says, And they said, Every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. We see their desire in this to see the person that is responsible for what is taking place to them. And I think this speaks to the extreme nature of this storm. Of it being something that's far greater than these men had ever experienced, just in the fact that they knew it was somebody's fault on the ship for what happened or what was happening. Well, when we seek to reject the Lord, when He comes knocking, it's going to be very apparent to us that it is the Lord as a result of us rejecting Him. We see that after casting the lots, and we don't know exactly what the method of this casting lots but it could have been, just simply something similar to picking straws or flipping a coin, something similar to this. We see that the lot fell upon Jonah. So the chance, and now here's the thing: there's no chances when the Lord is involved. This was the hand of God, but the lot falls upon Jonah. Continues verse 8 says, Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? Of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. We see here that upon realizing it to be Jonah, they begin investigating his life, asking him who he is. And I think this is to be a very humbling time for Jonah. Because he knows full well that it's his fault. And at this time, he's having to tell them, I am, an, I am a Hebrew. I am a prophet of my people, and I serve the God, who he mentions here as being the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. He's basically telling them, I follow the true God that controls everything. And to these men, they, upon hearing this, they are very, very afraid. At the process, at some point in this, he tells them that he ran, he was running from his God, uh, running away from him, and this causes them to be very insane. They take it very seriously. Well, it's sad again in noticing this, these pagan men, they are the ones encouraging Jonah to pray to his God, to seek his God, to uh, forgive them. And Jonah is the cause for it, and again, upon finding out that Jonah is the cause for it, and the reason for it, they say, why in the world are you doing this? Why are you rejecting your God? Why are you doing these things that cause Him to be mad at you? You know Him to be real. You've seen His hand. You know His word. And you're rejecting Him? They're done with him. You know, it is a sad thing when lost people have a better understanding of what saved people need to be doing. This is what's happened to Job. Lost people know what he's done is wrong. I think far too often we fall into the same trap of Jonah. We know the Lord to be true. We know his hand be real. We know of his power, strength, and we know his commandments. But yet we test him by rejecting those commandments. Sometimes we fall so deep into it that even the lost people know that what we're doing is wrong. I can't imagine the effect that this was having 
on Jonah's reputation as a prophet. They probably, from this point on, wouldn't believe anything that Jonah had to say. Definitely wouldn't follow him anywhere. Well, lost people aren't going to listen to us or follow us in the Lord if we ourselves are very, very easily seen to not be following God. Instead of leading these men to the Lord, Jonah has basically led them to their death. Instead of leading them to the blessings and the wonders of the Lord, Jonah has doomed these men by his decisions. We too, instead of leading people to the Lord, can be the ones to drag them right down. We can be the ones to drive them far, farther from the Lord than they've ever been. I was seeing verse 11, it says, Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempest. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea was wrought, the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Again, we see the nobleness of these men in comparison to Jonah. He tells them to throw me over the edge, and these men are still willing to do whatever they can to try and keep from having to throw them over the edge. They make the attempt to row towards land to drop them off, and they finally discover that. They are unable to do that. And in verse 14 we see it says, Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. These men up to this point have been seeking false gods. But at this point in time, Jonah has still not prayed to the Lord. We have not seen that he has prayed to the Lord. And these men are the first one to seek God's face in the straw. These men, yet again, have set the example for Jonah instead of Jonah setting the example for them. But they plead of the Lord, please do not hold his sins against us. Please forgive us. So in verse 15 it says, So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. They throw him into the sea, and as a result they see him as being the true God. They see him as being their Lord, and we see that they even offer sacrifices unto the Lord, and make vows to follow him. You know, there's a lot of the mistakes that Jonah has made up to this point, but there's at least one decision that he made right, which was to sacrifice himself for the rest. We see, though, verse 17, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. We're going to stop there, but we see that the Lord has a plan for Jonah still. Jonah's not getting out of it that easy. I wonder if Jonah may have been thought that he was going to get out of it. But that's not the case. And this is something to remember as well. Go the Lord's path the first time, because you don't know, want to know what kind of rotten mess he can get you in to get you on the right path. Well, this is a pretty rough way of getting to Nineveh. Pretty uh, 
stinky way, I'm sure. And yet it's all because Jonah decided to reject it the first time around. I'm not going to say it's always the case that things are rough because of our mistakes, because it's not. Scripture makes that very clear that things can be rough even when we make all the right mistakes or all the right decisions. But at the same time, don't make it harder on yourself by rejecting God's plan the first time. Because that's all that's going to happen. Going to make it harder. If God wants to use you for the plan, and if you have another opportunity, because here's the thing, we're not even told that we're guaranteed a second chance like Jonah. Jonah gets the second chance and is able to try again. But the lesson is still there for us to not try and flee from God because we can't take it away from Him. He is everywhere all the time. His power is unending and is everywhere. So don't tempt Him. 